welcome to episode 37 of the hard truth about b2b e-commerce i'm your co-host isaiah bollinger unfortunately tim is uh not with us today but he will be back on uh next episode um before i intro our awesome two guests today i gotta mention our sponsor unfortunately i'm not quite as good as tim at this but i'll i'll, I'll do my best uh, our sponsor is uh, Punch Out To Go, which is a global B2B integration company. They specialize in connecting e-commerce and all commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP uh, applications. So Punch Out To Go is essentially is an iPaaS technology that seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. Um, so with their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexity for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales automation, order automation documents uh, in order to achieve better results. So if you're looking for automation uh, in e-commerce and commerce in general, definitely reach out to punch out to go. They really have a strong handle on, on procurement and things like Coupa. Um, and I think our, our guests today also have a little bit of an insight into that world, especially on the CRM side, uh, which we'll definitely get into. So I'm very excited to, to welcome Will and Sean from Fitzmartin. Uh, and you guys are, I guess you would describe yourselves as kind of the sales experts in the B2B world, uh, you know, from top of the funnel to kind of the bottom of the funnel. Is that a good way to describe it and how you guys that's help perfect. companies? Yeah, that's perfect. We're sales <laughs> first. We're scientifically inspired. Uh, we're a consultancy that uh, works with executive teams of emerging middle market businesses. And that's such an exciting space because we have this, uh, this, these, these people who are knowing there's ways to sell better. They're yeah. growing, they're getting more leverage, but the old systems aren't working anymore. You know, the things they did a couple of years back aren't still, they're just not sustainable. So they're coming to us and we're able to come in and do what we call a sales barrier analysis. And we look at the entire journey from a pre-contemplating prospect, our client's prospects, all the way through to advocacy. And then we map out for these people, where is marketing failing? Where is marketing successful? Where is sales failing and where is sales successful? Mm -hmm. And then we create alignment, typically centered around technology, because it's such a core part of any B2B world. Uh, through that uh, through that journey, so that but there's a nickel tour. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a great Thank explanation. Thank you for having us. Thank you for no, having yeah, us this this is exciting. I think, uh, uh, I, and I didn't do the one thing you asked me to do. This is Will Riley. He's our director <laughs> of uh, revenue operations, and we're thrilled to have him here. He so I'm going to say the uh, conceptual stuff and all the details that matter. You want to listen to Will. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So how did you guys get into this? I, I, you know, I'm, did you, I'm assuming this wasn't your first company or maybe, maybe it was. And, uh, but, I mean. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we've been in this space for 30 years. Um, and yeah, Will's not even 30 years old, right? No, no. Yeah. Almost, <laughs> I can't remember. Um, I'm as old as the company. So. <laughs> and, um, but we're, uh, you know, the journey, I mean, it, my journey and Fitzmartin's journey is, the world changed. So it changed really for us two times. In 2002, it changed for us when we went from a really good design shop that had some strategies um, and, and would started to sell strategy. And then we realized, you know what, we've got to have a scientific, reliable way to give repeatable results. And that's what we call cognitive marketing, that, that application of behavioral science to the sales and marketing journey. So that was one revolution that occurred. About the same time, the revolution occurred of if you're going to be in B2B, if you're going to be an expert, if you're going to produce results and revenue for your clients and you don't understand technology deeply, you're going to be gone, right? So that journey is when people like Will and Will is uh, the absolutely the most advanced person that's ever been on the team. Uh, you know, we, we took all these little baby steps and and I say, I bet you see these disconnected systems or yeah. maybe a CRM over here and an ERP over here and an e-commerce. Maybe let's tack that on later. You know, this, this disjointed technology became a, a view a, a normal view of life for us. And we yeah. said, we got to fix that. And that's when this idea of revenue operations came along. But, you know, I mean, if it's it's incomplete, what Will does is incomplete. If he just focuses on technology it doesn't change anything. If, if I just focus on 
marketing or just focus on sales, it doesn't change anything. You've got to have these three pieces congruently aligned, not only to each other, but through the whole journey. And, and that's the brilliance. That's the way Will's been able to produce some amazing results is by connecting all those dots. Yep. And I think we're now seeing a new kind of like challenge for these companies that we focus a lot on the mid market as well. And I think the mid market especially struggles with this because they're not, you know, they're not quite uh, the Grangers of the world. So they don't have like this massive sophisticated team that can kind of figure this all out. You know, those companies can throw millions of dollars at these problems and generally hire some of the best people to solve it. So the mid market doesn't quite have that luxury, but they have enough complexity where they have like an ERP, you know, maybe it's their CRM is their ERP, but maybe they have a separate CRM ERP and now an e-commerce platform because they sell right. generally some sort of hard goods, but sometimes even services we do, we deal with downloadable products, uh, videos, and just more and more things can be sold online. And now you're kind of in this weird spot where it's like, well, some things are kind of being sold online, but some things they might call in and buy. Maybe someone calls in and buys, but also buys online. Right. You have right. all these different ways that someone might buy from you. And then it's like, right. how, to, from an operations standpoint, I mean, that's one of the big problems we see uh, with e com with B2B e-commerce. And it's just, it's just more complex. It's not, you know, it's not, a, you know, like I said it earlier before we started, it's not a Shopify site where you're selling t-shirts. It's generally, a lot more complicated than that. We have, I will, I'd love for you to share a story about, um, we have a, a client in the occupational health space and that was one of our first journeys in, hey, you know what? E-commerce actually does matter even if we're not going out and trying to sell all kinds of consumer type things to the world. But e-commerce and B2B is significant. And Will's got a great story of, of uh, Money saved and money made. Yeah, let's let's hear it, and then we'll kind of go off. Yeah, from yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and before into the case too. I mean, uh, you mentioned this earlier on the call, Isaiah, but or uh, before we got going, um, we notice when we come in to clients, whether they're emerging middle, you know, um, bigger than that or smaller than that. Um, these departments are in silos. Marketing is doing their own, sure. <laughs> their own thing with their own tech stack, sales, and then service. If we're just kind of in those generalized buckets, speaking to those different departments, marketing, sales, and service, we just noticed that we had to create a product. We had to say, you know what, before we get going with an, you know, before a creative solution or revenue solution, we have got to. Um, do a MarTech eval. So we we ended up having to create a product after just a repeatable issue in this space of just fragmented systems that are not connected and data not being transferred to other systems. Um, so it's kind of interesting that marketing has had to put on this you know additional hat, if you will, of just better understanding our clients' customers. Um, and and well, what comes with that? Oh, go ahead. That. I want to support that and emphasize that. So your listeners, Isaiah, I mean, you've the the first person most I see most executive teams going to is IT and say solve this problem. Well, you can have a perfectly beautifully integrated IT solution that ignores the customer's needs. That's why we <laughs> believe marketing should be the person that does this, right. working closely with IT, mm. not separately, closely, but. You know, marketers are, are, that's what we do, right? We're trained to understand how people buy things yes. and how to make that as smooth and seamless as possible. Yeah. And that's not the, what, what IT is trained for. They're trained to do things that we're not trained to do. For sure. So I just want to make that uh, that point of, yeah, I, but I agree. Tried that, this, yeah. I, I agree that I think B2B is kind of a little bit in a struggle right now, especially in the mid market where, sales marketing and it are very mm. siloed but they mm. all need each other and because they're siloed they're really just not achieving optimal results and like you said earlier i think if they don't figure this out better they they, they won't exist in the future because you know we're seeing even companies that you wouldn't expect like a wayfair who you think of like b2c furniture they have a b2b program and that's actually much easier for them to grow that than these right. companies to kind of pivot and figure this all out with yeah. these siloed things yeah. Unless right. maybe they hired you guys. <laughs> right. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The obvious real answer. Right? <laughs> we'll, we'll be tracking Wayfair's. Uh, so, yeah, Will, on, I, on I took us off your I took us off your story because it's a very practical story that I think well, people the, should and, consider. And, 
And, and where it came to, um, where this, this one example was marketing was being curious. We were, we wanted to move the needle, uh, and to move the needle effectively, we've got to understand where different pains are within the org chart. So this sales team in particular, um, they're, they're, uh, they have an inbound and outbound model where the inbound is receiving some of the service calls. So they don't have yep. a separate kind of, they have tech support, but not like customer service. That's more of the inbound sales methodology yep. at that level. And uh, they were spending like each rep was spending like 30 minutes a day. And that didn't seem like a lot. I mean, it really on, just in, on, on inbound calls on inbound calls that were not producing revenue. Gotcha. So we we're like, okay. well, what? Well, what if we took? Yeah. What, what do you what, mean they weren't produ- like they just weren't closing like thirty? Well, hours. these were these were just like help desks, kind of like not technical, but they were just like a certain part of the business that could have been totally automated with an e-com solution. Gotcha. Okay, having, these I weren't mean, like new sales. They're just like, hey, right, like, right, I right. ordered this part, but I did like, when's it coming? Or like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 they, and they sell they sell products and and are in that space, but they had a. The example is calibration. It was an annualized event that happened every year, and it just took at least 30 minutes of one of the reps' time every single day of them just like answering the phone, getting the part number, filling out a purchase order. Like, just like everything was manual. They had no yeah, system yeah, 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 for yeah. like kind of yeah. online payments and stuff like that. But then it was also connected to there was an event, like a calibration that happens every year for this product. So we were, we just heard this in a meeting. We're like, we have, we have got to automate this. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have got to, you know, not only like, are we going to just save you time and money, which is a, a big value add. We're to, we're going to integrate a system, an e yeah. solution into your current CRM and MAT to where you're not having to think about it, you know, because yeah. I mean, this process was involving three different people's like not only are you having the the initial tax of having a 30 minute phone call that could be automated but then three different departments are having to work on that ticket now yeah, yeah so you're yeah, talking yeah. about a very expensive so we're talking about a couple of hours probably or an hour at no, least at yeah. least at yeah, least yeah, yeah. i mean i mean not we, to mention uh i think people always forget that's probably not a great customer experience either because you're like i have to spend half an hour on the call for something that like you feel like you should be able to go on and click like two buttons and be done right right right, right. right. yeah so we, sorry we, continue. We, no no no. you're fine well because of you know companies like wayfair or warby parker or we're just so consumer driven with automated solutions with you know amazon and and, and yeah. fill, in the, fill in the blank that um, B2B, to your point, is just is is in a weird place of like, how do we create that amazing customer experience, even though we're not a consumer retailer that is at a mass um, uh, yeah. in mass like an Amazon. And I yeah, think selling that, small parcels or. Yeah. Exactly. And I yeah. think that we're, they're going to have to evolve to think more like the Amazons of the world. For sure. And, Absolutely. And, and if they're not spending time on CX and, and thinking about that. Then I mean, because you know, you can come in and to your point, you can buy a Shopify, a Stripe, uh, any kind of payment processor, or an e-com site, and just turn it on. But if it's not integrated and is a is bettering the customer's experience, then you're just wasting more time and money. Exactly. You, know? you can you know? throw up your products and throw it up on a site and 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 click add to cart and buy, but to actually integrate it into the sales process was just what I really want to talk about with you guys. It's a whole different ball game that I think it's not just the technical side. Like you're saying, it starts right. with in sales. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah. for, for this client in particular, you know, we were able to build in new customer, you know, re-engagement workflows as well as cart abandonment workflows. And like yep. that, that typically is siloed in a consumer driven, a B2C environment that has absolute B2B context. So we were, sure. you know, in, in some ways, it was, a, it was a really interesting, I think, dynamic for us and for them is that e-commerce works in B2B. It's just not how we typically experience it at a consumer level outside of business, you know? For sure. Um, and I think, for, you know, for them, I mean, we saw, you know, I'm just pulling up the chart. Um, I mean, like, LTV and savings in implementing e-com for them was like 600 grand. I mean, it was insane. I mean, just in, just off the top in savings. I mean, there, he's a, there, six, Will's a marketer. Six, he's exaggerating. It was $585,900. <laughs> so that's, so their, that's their savings in the, in the cost of doing the transactions basically. Yeah. Wow. Lifetime value to the company. 
Wow. And it was, wow. it was a, um, I don't want to tell you how much they paid. It was modest. We should have charged double. You, know? you should have done a performance uh, deal. You're like, man, if that's we right, should. That's right. That's hey, we'll, we'll do it contingent on this. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I know. It's Sometimes amazing. that happens when you, you see the results. You're like, man, we're making those people a lot of money. If only we... Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> well, and, I think they had, and they had CRM in place, right? They had an ERP in place. So they could, <laughs> they could do their accounting, run their systems, keep their inventory. They, had, they knew who these people were. Uh, but they didn't have any kind of marketing technology. They didn't have a payment processor in place and they didn't have uh, any kind of e-com solution online. So, and beyond that, they didn't have the training and the organizational structure. So, I mean, it's a, there is a lot of complexity to, to this story. Uh, so what Will did is we actually took an inside sales force and equipped them to be a customer success sales force because they didn't have that department at that time. So, you know, that what that what's not told in that $585,900 number is the um, is the the efficacy increase, you know, what what performance gain did inside sales have because they could get back to their job. <laughs> yeah, it's hard yeah. to measure all the additional value yeah. and not to mention hopefully it's a better customer experience and that might add to you know, millions of new dollars that it's hard to attribute because they're like, Hey, it was a better experience. You know, I'm going to come back to these guys and buy, you know, next year, maybe they do a bigger order. Who knows what happens that you can't perfectly track on, on e-com. And I think that's part of the, part of the problem is, is a lot of companies have a tough time justifying the spend to implement e-commerce because yeah. sometimes it can be complicated and, and it can be a bigger investment than like a simpler B2C site. Yeah. And because they're thinking of it as just IT or this little silo, right? It's harder for them to justify the cost because they're like, oh, we're just going to automate some of these little orders. But what about mm -hmm. all the marketing value and all the other values that you get that that sometimes it's hard to like perfectly measure all of that? So, well, in this, to one, in this one front, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say to give context to the listeners, um, this in particular was about an $8 million company in gross revenues. So, this was a significant number so what's uh, you know do math real quick it's uh five percent of their yeah. gross revenues that got added yeah. in a in a finger in a finger snap yeah uh, will do you remember i'm gonna i'm gonna put you on the spot here do you remember how many hours a year were saved i mean it was a significant number of, of oh, fte yeah. hours i wonder oh yeah. their team was wasting an fte salary that's what it was it was they were wasting one person yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not surprising to me. They were, they were spending that. Yeah, they were wasting that much time, about 35 hours a week. So, and it's fun as, a, as an old school marketer, as the guy with no hair on the call. Um, <laughs> I would, used to say gray hair, but now it's kind of hard to say no that. Hair. <laughs> um, you know, I'm so used to being that guy, the marketing guy that comes in and, well, you know, we'll spend X dollars with you. But how are we going to know what the ROI is? How do we know if your work matters? I mean, technology has been astonishing in its ability now for us to prove our revenues impact, our our value, whether it's cost savings or an increase in revenue. It's it's and and not every customer that we have wants to invest in the work it takes to do the tracking. That's whether it's ads. If we're in a pixel environment, we're trying to say, you know, we're going to track these ads and see. Yeah. revenue is coming from our work or whether it's just having um, you know, the right codes and engaged. So we know a B testing work, you know, so everybody doesn't do it, even though it's there. And, and there is an investment in, um, in doing the tracking and investing in the technology and the implementation. And, um, you know, I, I, and probably as an aside, another thing that Will's been really fabulous at, he, he worked with, um, about a three hundred million dollar company with nineteen in nineteen countries around the globe, software services business, and um, he made several observations that I thought were great. Um, too many technologies, too little integration, uh, lack of uh, database penetration within their own databases, um, you know, lack of funding to really organize and go to market. But Will found a way for them to cut their tech spend by about $120,000 a year and improve the performance. And it was more measurable. I mean, that's a win, right? Just out Absolutely. of the gate. Yeah. I, I, and I think B2B struggles with, with, with measuring things. 
And I'm curious um, how you guys, this is kind of maybe a different way than, than even we've talked about in the podcast, but approaching B2B e-commerce, like you said, maybe starting at marketing and sales and, and actually starting at like almost the CRM level, like, okay, so how, how do customers come to us and maybe how do they, how do we want them to come to us? Maybe it's like, okay, we want to grow with more SEO and more, you know, ads like right now they're, they're coming through our sales reps, but you know, you want to grow some digital marketing presence and e-commerce can obviously help with that. If you have your right. product catalog out there and people will find you more. Um, but I'm curious to, to hear how you guys think that, you know, maybe they should kind of like tailor in e-commerce into the sales process versus I think what mm -hmm. we're seeing is a lot of times they yeah. just come to someone like Trellis and they're like, Hey, we need e-commerce, like get us a quote. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> We can do well, that, yeah, but like, how right. does this tie into your sales force? So I'm curious right. how you guys, like, I think the, the, the story you brought up is great where it's like, Hey, we're like, maybe it's better to focus on a specific part of the problem. Like, all right, 30% of our sales time is spent on things that like are smaller transactions. Let's automate yeah. those and get that done instead of trying to do like all the crazy stuff. So you can get more like targeted with what you're actually doing on like phase one of e-commerce. So that's the other thing too, is right. like, these projects can get complex. So if you try and do phase one, two, three, and four, you're probably going to put yourself in a bad position where if you actually distilled it down to like a phase one, that's achievable right? and tied into a sales goal, maybe starting with kind of your guys CRM marketing approach. Like, so I, I, there's a long winded kind of like question, but like, how would you guys kind of approach that or maybe bring in like a, a partner like Trellis to do the, let's say that. Right. Team. Right. Well, I mean, just the complexity that that one site with one product had like seventy five pricing variants on there. So when, you, <laughs> when you look at the the different codes that have to be funneled in and the fulfillment records, um, just in the pricing structure, there's complexity at that level. So something as simple as you know, I have a product worth X, and I want someone to put either a PO behind it or a credit card and purchase it well when you look at add-ons and does it subtract does it add to it is it multiple quantities is there a max coupon codes i mean yeah exactly i mean like yeah i mean um, an, an expert like trellis is is extremely uh beneficial at the implementation uh no doubt um, yeah and, that's, and even the ongoing that's usually the first question i ask is like so how do you do pricing and right. it's always like it's funny because a lot of times they don't even have a good answer. They're like, well, we, we, you know, like you might be able to get a quote, but like we have some price lists and it's just like, it's not usually a very concrete answer. Like you would think that pricing would be very standardized, but a lot of times it's like no. way more up in the air than I think it should be with these companies. Yeah. Which is, yeah. Just put a, <laughs> put a sticker on it, you know, yeah. um, for, for us, in, in an in a even recent example that I think is um, can be standardized for sure is, have you done a voice of the customer program? I mean, really, a lot of the e-com solutions that we're finding, just at where, where we are from a RevOps-minded uh, agency, um, we're just more curious than probably, you know, uh, a, a focused only on marketing uh, or only on digital type firm where we look yeah. at the complexity of those different departments. Um, we're probably asking different questions. So like, you know, are, what's your average acquisition cost? What's your, you know, yep. LTV? Do you have a centralized dashboard? I mean, just some of those generalized things, but even in a recent example with a client an industrial manufacturer, um, I mean, we're talking about the idea of like, what would it look like to have a replacement parts store yeah. <laughs> and, and things like that. So, I mean, we're, we're instantly just thinking about like, we, we've done interviews as marketers, we've done research, our current customers work with us because of our service. Like we know that. So like it started out marketing did research and we got insight from the customer. So yeah. probably very similar to how most agencies work or in some agencies at that level. And we take, we took that and wrote, well, how do we double down on service? What would it look like to reinvent service? So you really have a blue ocean floor um, outlook or uh, in those planning sessions. And um, I think a lot of it for us has just been stemming from, are we focused on the customer at all aspects of the journey? I mean, we um, our, our, sh our data that we use from our process shows Isaiah, Isaiah that, 80% of our current customers at any time could retreat to earlier stage in the funnel and 
are contemplating whether staying with you or not. And that's that's true to your base, to our base, just kind of B2B um, current customers that 80% could retreat. Mm. So if we're not investing and focus on the customer, we're going to lose them. Yeah, You yeah. talk about B2B dying. Well, a subset of that is if we don't focus on the customer, if we keep talking about our products, keep talking about ourselves and not talk about the customer and focus on them, in a VOC type voice of the customer exercise, then we're not even giving e a chance to uh, yeah. appear on the radar. Because yeah, to your gonna... point, we can build an e site and you can knock it out of the park, but you care and we care about their livelihood as a business and they better elevate their thinking uh, if they're going to make it. For sure. The guy with no hair, I'm going to put on the hat of uh, every B2B executive who's listening right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Riley. Yeah, right. Marketing guy. I know my customers better than anybody. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been in the field with them. I've been at their places. I, well, I'm not going to learn anything. To which I always had the same offer. And that's we do. And I think this is a, a really cool uh, thing that you can do without us. Everybody can do this. Have a third party. You got to have a third party. Nobody ever, uh, Will, Will's wife professionally is a counselor. Um, <laughs> and nobody, you can't go into marriage counseling and then say, okay, honey, I'm going to be the counselor. I'm also going to be me. And we're going to talk through this problem, right? <laughs> you have to get a third party. <laughs> yeah. Well, your marketing is no different. Yeah, yeah. You might know, you've got a point of view of your customers and do you know them intimately? Yes, you do because you've been serving them, helping them, solving problems, but you've got one point of view. So the value that marketing can have and what, what I'll offer that, that crusty old B2B executive Sorry, those of you who aren't crusty or old, um, but I'll just say, look, we're going to call three current customers, third party. We're going to call three lost customers, people who no longer work with you. And we're going to call three prospects and we're going to charge you a minimal amount of number. I think we charge $12,000 or something like that. If when we come back to you and share with you what we learn from those three in-depth interviews, one-to-one -one interviews, if we add no value to your point of view of the customer, I'll give you the $12,000 back at the table. I'll bring a check. And I've never had anybody say no, and I've never had to write the check. Wow. It's just that third party point of view. It's not that we're smarter than you. In fact, and we know we know your customer less than you, and that is the value. So I think just to Will's point, you know, it's so, so many people buy shiny objects, you know, and, and we're all kind of squirrel. Hey, there's a new marketing tech, right? So we, we're, we just kind of live that way. We get excited about new tech. But if you don't root it in that voice of the customer, if you don't root it in that other point of view, that it's impossible for you to have internally. If you're the SVP of sales, the CEO, the CMO, uh, any, and not, you can't have a point of view of your customer. Only your customer can have that point of view, right? So, so let me ask two questions about that. I, I, and you guys seem to do those. You know, it sounds like a, a great uh, way for you guys to kind of help someone for a you know, reasonable starting point. Um, what a non-technology way to start helping tech, right? Yeah, exactly. Without you know, also saying, hey, you need to do this big, giant project. Um, yeah. How many of those come back and, and, and you find that uh, it's kind of a two-part question that it's either too hard to buy from them or too hard to kind of like continue buying from them meaning like you know i gotta call in it it's hard to find get what i want yeah. like how much of that is kind of coming up and where i'm going with this is could e-commerce generally be some sort of solutions that you know i mean i would say e-commerce is is it can almost always be a solution and and b2b it's such an easy answer that was a layup isaiah i know what you just did, <laughs> um and you should call isaiah <laughs> but um, B2B is essentially <laughs> digital, right? So if you're in the business of business space, you've, you're, you're living in a digital world. We were actually in B2B ahead of the consumer world. The consumer world trailed business to business. Now, the consumer world is way ahead in terms of designed consumer experiences sure. and how to market. But, but we were actually in the lead as an industry, as a segment. Uh, I mean, B2B is like, what, that's two-thirds of the 
or maybe even four fifths of the exchange relationships that occur in the country and the GDP. So if you think yeah, about it, anything you lot. buy, that, yeah, that, the car that you bought, I mean, there's one consumer exchange when you bought that car and how many B2B exchanges sat behind that? The parts, the Thousands? assembly. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, so yeah, many. So. Yeah. So why wouldn't you make things simpler, make things, make transactions recordable? And here's, here's a really interesting thing. Um, and I, and I love bringing this up because this is a usually an undiscovered aha moment. Executives need to realize the data that gets built out of an e-commerce solution and other technology solutions is an asset for the company. And right now, if you're not using things in a digital way, that asset is, is sitting um, you know, in, on pieces of paper. It's sitting in somebody's Excel sheet that they take with them when they leave your company. Mm. It's sitting in an unminable destination. You know, you've got to see this as an asset. So yes, you're improving your customer's experience. But the other question you got to ask is why would you not build this as an asset? It's a minimal investment to have a, a data as an asset. I mean, there's a whole world of college students that's going to flood the market in the next four, five, six years. And they're all going to be able to mine this data. They're all going to get, if you're going through an undergraduate business degree today, you're going to learn how to, to pull insights, juicy insights out of data. Mm-hmm. So you're setting your business behind to not do e-commerce, not only because it's a better way to buy things, but because you're not building your database. And, and um, also to add to that, uh, I agree that all those younger people, we, we're, we're lucky to have some great, great younger people in the company, but even the, the millennials in the next four to five years, a lot of us are going to be, including myself, we're going to be in like our mid to late thirties. So what, they're going to be in positions of buying power. You're going to be dinosaurs, man. So old. Yeah. Y'all are we're gonna old. Be, yeah. We're going to be in positions of buying power where we're going to be the ones making big purchasing decisions. We're not going to want to have to call someone up every time we want to reorder something or go through some right. very slow process right. when we're used to just buying things online very quickly. So I to- totally, uh, uh, agree with you, but I want to touch on what you said that I think is really interesting because the data is so valuable. Where do you guys see the most opportunity of, of building that value? Is it, is it kind of a combination of the CRM e-commerce platform and and ERP Are those kind of the three main Mm -hmm. systems that you would say that companies in B2B should kind of focus on or, I know that's a very general question. It depends on the company, but no, I, I think Will's great to answer that one. And I think that we should add to your answer, Will, as we're thinking about it. I'm going to add to the question. In the light of GDPR, CCPA, and all the privacy mm. acts that are going to occur, where is the value of the data for businesses? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think um, at a core tech level, um, I would add uh, marketing automation to that. Sure. Um, and sometimes that can be, you know, if you're using a, let's just say a HubSpot for yeah, the CRM the same, and same that, yeah. or a, you know, Salesforce CRM with either a Pardot yeah. or, yeah. A, or a HubSpot instance, um, you're just definitely going to see the need to have those different techs all talk together um, because the the e-com is one fourth of that solution because, yeah. you know, one is like what, you know, we process it. One is where that money actually goes and pulls from. But then the other two functions are, is this account valuable? And can I run quote reports against what they've actually paid us? Because we may say, hey, you're spending too much time on this account. You've quoted them five times. They haven't, you, they haven't you know, fulfilled <laughs> anything yet. You need to stop <laughs> selling to them kind of deal, right? They're just in the cart. They've got a million just carts. In it, right. Yeah, yeah just, but there's no actual, they're not actually buying, yeah. <laughs> right. just, uh, well, the other side is, well, what what can marketing do? If maybe, maybe we've got a, um, a customer that's worth a million dollars and they keep buying this one part from us or this one, uh, um, you know, product that we have, but we want them to buy the next product, you know, MBA, a next best action, right? What's the (laughs) next thing we want them to buy? And uh, you're seeing this with credit unions and financial institutions uh, right now is they're creating their CRM and with their core technology is whether you realize it or not, when you're on your banking uh, website, you're getting a HELOC 
if you own a mortgage with or you have a mortgage with them. If you have an auto loan, then you're getting a credit card ad. So banking websites have are adding in and a, a, a kind of similar segmentation model with showing you the next product that they want you to buy. Yeah, and, and and I think that you know it's kind of loose loose example there, but we find that very interesting when you think about what we're trying to do. If we have a if we have a product product A and product A works better when product A and B are bought together, then why wouldn't we start on our website talking about A and B and the relationship between those yeah. two, right? Well, if I'm a marketer and I see 500 purchases for product A and I see 50 purchases for product B, well, I've got 450 people that I needed to be doing some nurture campaigns to, right? For sure. I mean, and, and I think that that whole component, yes, to your question, those three, and I think that in the B2B space, uh, marketers have a lot uh, to bring to the table if they choose to, because I think right now we're looking at um, payment processing and transactional data, not actionable data on the lack of purchases or the lack of combination of purchases. That's a great, that's, I, I, I like the idea of like, hey, looking at the data, you know, the abandoned carts, it's like, it's not just about what people bought or it's also about what they didn't buy. And, and, and yeah. the sales reps can go into that and say, oh, hey, you bought this one thing for a hundred bucks, but like, did you know that we have all the, yeah. And I think that's where sales kind of comes back in. E-commerce is an ally to sales and, and it shouldn't be a threat. It's just a tool that they can use. But going going back to just kind of, I like to simplify for, for people listening because I think a lot of this stuff can be kind of overwhelming, especially to an executive that's not in this world all day. It sounds like, you know, in terms of like the four core, you know, let's call it the four core systems. You kind of need essentially an e-commerce platform that would probably tie into your marketing technology, uh, marketing automation, and your CRM, and then your ERP. And in some cases, those could be similar systems, like your marketing automation and CRM could be the same. Yep. There's some cases where e-commerce platforms are actually tied like NetSuite has their own e-commerce platform. It's a right. little bit less used, but in theory, you could have one platform there. So there's kind of four tech main functions here. And however you kind of get them to all work together <laughs> or consolidate, you need to do that and somehow basically. Does, it, does that make sense? Like from a very simple <laughs> perspective. If you can simplify 12,000, 13, 14,000 tech options to four, I think that's great. And that's one of the ways... <laughs> Will has been successful is by simplifying, you know, and we would add probably one tech to that, and that is a sales enablement technology. So marketing, I think a lot of people have experienced frustration or given up on marketing technology, marketing automation technology, um, like a HubSpot or a Pardot. Yeah. Or, but the reason is those are inadequate. They're great early stage sales tools. They're miserable late stage sales tools. Late stage sales tools, we need to bring in a sales enablement tool. So we're, we would add that because what, of what kind of tool would that be? Just to Will, why don't you walk through some of our, our favorite options? Yeah, I was going to say HubSpot too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, uh, I love HubSpot as well. But what's another yeah. option in the market? Just so yeah, I think I mean something that we're using um, directly with sales is uh, Rollworks. Uh, we are okay. um, some something that we do with our um, tech stack is we look for partner uh, programs. So yep. we're we're not of the you know ten thousand plus yeah, market same, same with us. Tech. Yeah, you know we we will pursue that you know will resource us that we can participate in add product feedback and and has a and, community you know it has, has a, a community i think around. that's I mean, so that, important that's like but, such a non-negotiable but, you know? but it sounds like role works or something like that wouldn't be th I, the reason i'm saying the big four is i'm guessing that's not yeah. necessarily that expensive to implement maybe i'm misunderstanding but is it it's, uh, it's actually more than a marketing pro yeah it's about really? 13.3 13, at a low level um but it's but we really well, love the about SaaS it. costs i'm more th i'm always thinking about the services cost because um oh service is more yeah yeah really gotcha. oh yeah because it's 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 really beautiful of that you're um working directly with the sales team or sales force with an organization and you're doing account engagement versus lead generation. Uh, so it's a totally different strategy for how to get engagement and impact. Um, right. So for us, we're, we're trying to measure, hey, this account went to your website that viewed these low intent or high intent pages. 
this account is a grade B. Gotcha. I see. They're they're a grade B. You should put them on your pipeline. So they're a little. It's a it's a sophisticated tool in terms of you have a lot of data to handle. I can see how that can. Yeah, be yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, let's it, yeah. let's prioritize well, can, these to keep it sim- once again oh, to keep ahead. it simple. So. Um, let's say you're a hundred million dollar business. I think that's a good example of the mid market. Would you guys agree? Like hundred million dollar distributor manufacturing. So we, we love the emerging middle because of all the problems. So it's, I'd say just under that. We're, 50 we're, million. We're let's some, call it. Yeah. Let's, let's 20, call, 25, right. 50, 25, 50 million dollar B2B company. Let's say there's, we're, we get to clean. We just bought them. We get to start over like, perfect. you know, perfect world. Let's just pretend. Right. Like where, you know, where would you start? Probably. Would, I mean, and I'm not doing this to focus on e-commerce. There's honestly like at a, and I know it's all situational, yep. but let's say you probably would what start with the ERP system because without so, the accounting, you can't really do much without inventory and accounting or. Yeah, I, think that, <laughs> I think that's a fair say. So we're not even going to, I've never even met a business that didn't have that kind of fundamental system. In, but, um, so we're going to be surprised. They're out there. They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, so we do something very interesting and we call it working backward, selling backward. Um, so 98% of the marketing advertising firms in the country are focused on creating awareness and driving somebody forward into sale. Yeah. I think that's the exact opposite way you should do it. We think you should work with sales side by side, identify the people who have signaled intent, identify the people who sales is working with already, and let's create instant ROI by closing more of those deals. Then let's take a step backward and let's try to get more people into sales. Then let's take a step backward. So we're gonna do the shortest path to revenue first and the longest path to revenue, the longest path last, the longest path to path to revenue, is creating awareness. And yet 95% of the ad agencies in the country- That's all they do. Make, that's all they do. So yeah. we we work backward because yeah. it's the shortest path to revenue and it's the best thing for our client. So I think working backwards with that being said, I think you, you, know, you can't really do much without an ERP system, right? So we agree that that's probably one of the first places you got to start, right? Like shore that mm-hmm. up. It's yeah. kind of, it's uh, we, we've always looked at ERP as a separate, like it's not core, it's like foundational. And I know this sounds similar, <laughs> but um, uh, ERP is non-negotiable, right? I mean, you have to yeah. have that. You can make it and not have e-com, not have MAT, not have a CRM. And if you just had, you know, if people can call you and you can input um, invoices. And you could at least make you. revenue. You could be a $25 million. So, you know, I think we agree that the ERP is kind of the foundation yes, yeah. and then it, yeah. and it builds off of that. And then I would probably say what CRM, maybe CRM is probably number two. CRM is right yeah, under yeah. that. No yeah. doubt. Yeah. And, and then, that might be part of their ERP. You can't identify yeah. who your late stage people are without a CRM. Right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. For sure. Then actually we might look at a, a sales enablement tech and a marketing automation tech. Gotcha. Um, so you could do sales enablement without marketing automation. I don't think, Will, I don't think it would be wise, would you? No, there's yeah. there's so much data in having both. Um, you really, because you can have MAT without sales enablement. You can't have sales enablement without the MAT. Um, so I think it's probably uh, connected. I, I, I think one thing I've seen drive revenue or drive revenue, drive recommendations as we've worked is often we don't recommend the most powerful tool. We recommend the easiest tool to use. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That that still fits their needs. It's kind of what we do with e-commerce. Yeah. So then let's say you got that, then e-commerce almost sits in the middle of all that. Because, I mean, it's kind of connecting the CRM, the ERP, yep. and right. the MarTech, and potentially this this type, this type this other enablement tool that might help them segment. The, the, and, and it's not a, you know, and if it's number three or four, it's not that that's least important or in the middle. It's just that that's just the priority that it should yeah. be looked at. Yeah, because so, it's hard to do a good job without some of these foundational impo- components, right, right. which I agree with. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So if you think about it that way, I think that's part of the problem is that companies are in some ways overcomplicating what's going on. Mm-hmm. And if you just looked at those, let's call it five systems now. Now it's the the big five. I, we started with four, now it's five. Yeah. You just made a s- reasonable investment in all five of those systems. You'd probably be ahead of most of your competition in the, in yeah. the mid-market. Would you agree with that if you? Yeah, I think so. I think one thing we're seeing too is some of the largest of those systems 
that might represent one piece or maybe two pieces of the big five, the new, the new big five. Um, we're on to something. It, yeah, we're on to <laughs> something. Yeah, grade eight, maybe. That, no, okay. Contextual. <laughs> we're recording this in March, so I guess I just yeah, we tried to away. make a bracket reference work. So. <laughs> so my bracket's still strong, baby. Um, the um, I, I forgot my point. It was going to be a good one. You're too. saying one of the, one of them is taking up a big chunk. Um, oh, big yeah. Chunk. So even some of these larger, really cash rich entities they're in one or two spaces. We see looking kind of behind the curtain, we see them pushing into more integration so that you can have a singular system. We don't, I don't see them really pushing into uh, say the ERP side of things. I don't see um, great plain software pushing up into marketing, but, and I don't see marketing stuff trying to get into the accounting ERP world, but we, we are seeing more and more, companies saying, we're going to cover demand gen, we're going to cover marketing automation, sales enablement, and customer success. And we can, you know, we'll add some live chat and we're going to mash all this up. So we, we do, I do think that's going to become a simpler solution with a much harder decision because you're going to be committing to one company to do everything well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot least- of... Pretty yeah, well, right? of those five systems, you know, potentially you could c- consolidate that down to two or three. Yep. And then, like you said, those are massive. And we say this with e-commerce. I mean, e- e-commerce could potentially foray into some of those other things. Like you could maybe have like kind of an ERP bolt on to the e-commerce or there might be a way right. where you could make the, the e-commerce system do some of those other systems. Oh, right, right, right. And, yeah. um, but, but we always say it should be, I always say it should be at least a three to five year decision. It's hard to predict beyond that. And I think some people get short-sighted with these decisions. They're like, oh, yeah, like, you know, Shopify is probably one of the easiest examples. It's great for getting up and running easy uh, and fast, but there are certainly limitations. Not every, it doesn't have, you know, every platform has pros and cons, right? And if you're not right, thinking right. about, like, what about in five years? Is this going to, like, work for me in five years? You might choose it, right. and then you're like, oh, crap. Like, now I got to replatform in, yeah. in a year and a half. And Right. <laughs> but we've also seen, I think, the negative of the white, I'll just call it white sheet kind of companies. Like here's, we have open tech and you can do anything with this. <laughs> we see massive amounts of development, hard in, uh, implementations, bad user adoption. And so we're, we're saying, yeah, that, that system, that other system, and I'll, I'll just say it, right? I'll just say it, don't tell anybody. Salesforce. We think Salesforce is an incredibly powerful tool, but you've got to have dedicated people to manage and run. Oh, and for get sure. And, Absolutely. And we see other tools and we'll, we'll often lean into a HubSpot kind of solution because it's powerful, not as powerful as a white sheet of paper that Salesforce offers you, but it's usable out of the gate and user adoption works. Can it do everything the Salesforce enterprise world does? No, it can't. It just can't. Right, it's not a white sheet of paper. And, so and, I, I don't think the merging middle market and the middle market needs these massive white. There sheets might of paper. be some cases where they do, but I, but to your point, um, you know, uh, we have a, we see a very similar thing in our space where Magento and Salesforce actually has a complicated solution. They're kind of in that white sheet of paper space where if you want a really complicated, you know, awesome solution, it can be that. But it can also be really, really poorly implemented because, you know, generally it's actually really expensive to do a good job and people kind of underestimate that. So yeah. Shopify and big commerce are kind of that better, simpler solution for that, you know, right. people that don't need that, like you right. said, that white sheet of paper. Well, so you have a very remember, similar experience, but with just slightly different technologies. What, what, I, of course, is what, one I, of them. <laughs> what I said, yeah, what I said earlier about the CEO can only have one point of view and that's theirs. They can't have the customer's point of view. My point of view is shaped by a client of ours who had dropped a million bucks on dev, had a dysfunctional system. We dev on CRM? It. Like, a, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we replaced it with a system that what we could do with a million bucks. It would be pretty cool. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. we, we, could have, we could have the big six. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll create a new system for yeah, we'll create a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back and touch on one more thing, Isaiah, back to technology wise as, as relates to marketing. And, and I, 
what I thought was I throwing a softball to Will by throwing in the Privacy Acts, the GDPR, CCPA. I think those are things that are serious and, and technology has to pay attention. And we're, we're actually beginning to work a process and taking a more definitive opinion. But what I'm seeing in the market space is that that's going to happen. My crystal ball, which is typically pretty worthless, um, <laughs> the uh, in ninety, I will I will take credit that in ninety two, I predicted the internet would kind of phase out and wash over. So, <laughs> so take this for what it's worth. And meanwhile, I, I grew up I grew up buying Pokemon cards on eBay, and I and I told my parents that ecom was the future, and they didn't believe me. <laughs> wow. I should have listened to you, Will Raleigh. <laughs> My parents, you know, on that note, they they literally, man, I'll never forget when we doubted you about the internet. Like they'll just like <laughs> random. They're in their like late sixties now. They still bring that up. I was like, look, I wasn't ahead of anything. It just that's just where we were at the time. <laughs> so, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I think as privacy comes uh, becomes uh, tighter, more restrictive, the buy the buying of third party data. Is it, if it gets more restrictive, I do think capitalism will figure it out. But I also believe that um, your the, the arguments around a business having its own content, its own specialization, its own understanding of its own customers, and reaching those people with value, that's going to trump the third-party data you can buy. So I think I companies agree. that have bought data and they're it's working or maybe kind of working. I think it's going to stop working as well, or it's going to get prohibitive or it's going to become gray kind of out of bounds a little bit. Um, and the, and the re- rationale to invest in marketing is not to do that marketing thing. It's going to be, it's a hedge. I believe it's going to be a hedge uh, in protecting your business's space. To create legal um, data, basically to create. Correct. On, on, yeah, and it's a moat because it's hard to do, and and it's going to be harder and Scary. harder for competitors to to do that. And if you can do that better than them, yeah. I agree. I I totally agree. So we're we're running a little bit, uh, you know, out of time. I, I think you mentioned there's two things I want to leave people with because I think they're going to be really valuable. Is one. You mentioned this book. Do you want to bring that up? Or uh... well, yes, you guys are amazing. <laughs> we just have such respect um, for your podcast, and uh, you know the hard truth about B two B e-commerce is you need you need some help, right? So uh, <laughs> it's a great podcast, and you need multiple um, different types of help. Like we're part of that help, but we're not the only solution. You know, fair enough. So. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So, uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, privileged to be uh, published by Rock Bench Publishing out of New York, New York, Nashville. It's kind of like New York, but smaller, um, out of Nashville. And um, it, I wrote a book called Shift. And the book is designed uh, it's to offer executives who are in charge of this marketing thing, but they don't haven't been trained for that task. So Isaiah and uh, The Hard Truth was kind enough to buy a couple copies. And if you want a copy, you can come to fitzmartin.com slash free help. And there's a simple form there you can fill out. And my EA will reach out to you and ship you a book. So thank you, Isaiah, for buying a couple of books. We appreciate you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, if we can get people to read, that's always a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's chapters four and five are going to be key to this because it'll provide a point of view of understanding this customer journey and there's a chapter about technology and and understanding what to do there so just go to your website and slash free help you said is that yeah fitzmartin.com f-i-t-z-m-a-r-t-i-n.com and uh, there's some other things on the free help uh tab i'm old enough i've decided just to give away anything i know i mean come on we all there's no secrets in our business right (laughs) i agree (laughs) that's why i'm doing this podcast like i'm like you know it actually helps me being like hey these are all the things you should do because then we work with a customer hopefully they're more educated and we have less uh because a lot of times the education you can't charge for all that anyway so yeah (laughs) will and will riley and i did a couple podcasts uh, on marketing technology with one of our coworkers, anna savarney who brought to us that that b2b experience from the bayer chemical kind of thinking of the world and uh, so there's some some other content about technology and uh, it's on the pod on our our website's podcast um, there so you can check that out as well and more, more free help awesome well, we're definitely going to have to bring you guys back on. I think uh, it sounds like you guys are probably going to see more and more e-commerce pop up in, in B2B. And I'm sure 
when you come back on, you'll have more stories to tell and stories, nightmares. And, and, you know, there's always a nightmare story and there's always the good story, right? Right. (laughs) We just want to do the good stuff today. (laughs) Yeah. When you said that a story popped in mind, the nightmare story, I could tell it right now, but we'll save it. Those take a long time. We'll have to spend another hour on that one, you know? So, uh, but the last thing I wanted to to just revisit before you go is I really like that, uh, that offering you guys have, can you just repeat that for people? Um, they could, you know, if they wanted to kind of start working with you, a good way is to potentially just do this kind of like, we'll, we'll investigate your sales, you know, your customers and your, 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 uh, sure. like a sales customers. barrier. Yeah. yeah. We have that is called the sales barrier audit and it's an analysis of the way people move through the buying journey at your company. So it's customized to you. It's, um, it's a great first step for working with us. And we actually like it as a first step too, because um, everybody's worried about when they hire a consultancy or, or an agency, whether we're crazy or not. Um, well, the other hard truth, we're kind of worried whether you're crazy. So this gives us a great, <laughs> great opportunity um, uh, to, to both work together. Uh, I think that's so true. And, um, but yeah, that th- thank you so much for that. So yeah, I, I, I really appreciate you guys joining. Um, we'll definitely have to have you guys back on. And, and I think we'll be in touch. I have a feeling we'll, we'll find ways to work with each other. <laughs> We'd be honored. Yeah, We'd be honored. That'd be great. All right. Thank Thanks you so much. Thanks so much for having us, Isaiah. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Bye.